Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. So let's get to the consumer confidence numbers uh, coming in for July at 100.3. Although you had June revised slightly lower, we're going to get the read now with Dana Peterson, chief economist at the conference board. I labeled this good, but with a question mark. Can you help me understand if this is a good report, bad report, what this means? I think it's kind of a mixed report. Yes, the headline ticked up a bit, but if you look over the last two years, it's been basically been moving around in the same range. It's been moving sideways. So, and really, that headline is made up of five different indicators, including uh, thoughts about business environment, employment, and also income. And certainly, when you look at the present situation, consumers are becoming less optimistic about the present situation, and they have been kind of dour on expectations, even though the expectations index ticked up a bit, it's still below 80, and 80 is kind of a signal of trouble. So what is the history, what does it tell us what consumers are going to actually do? Well, I think it's good to look at the the guts of the report where we ask them, what are you planning on doing about spending on goods and services? So with respect to goods, for the most part, they are not interested in buying homes or cars. They were a little bit more interested in buying appliances and also uh, electronics. Um, like PCs and laptops. But when it comes to spending on services, they're definitely down trading. And they're saying, we're going to spend mainly on services we need, not things we want. And we'll go to, we'll stream instead of going to the movies. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So when, except for Deadpool, obviously, when, did you get an indication in the survey of when that stops? Like how sensitive that reading in terms of spending on services and down trading might be to a rate cut, for example? Well, we look at these measures on a six-month moving average because from month to month, they're pretty volatile. volatile. And over the last six months, it continues to weaken in terms of buying durables. That makes sense because we know that durables are expensive and also uh, you have to finance them. We did see in the Q2 GDP report a pickup in spending on durables, but I think it was also because prices were lower, so consumers kind of jumped in there. But really, we're not seeing much um, in terms of a big d- desire to buy durables. And certainly yeah. with services, they're buying cheaper services. All right, Dana, we appreciate it. Thanks for the instant analysis. Dana Peterson, Chief Economist at the Conference Board, joining us. No table saws yet for John Tucker. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Alex Steele alongside John Tucker. Paul Sweeney is off today. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business, economics, and finance through our lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence folks They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries all around the world. We also have an amazing print team here at Bloomberg, and they literally cover everything around the world, particularly when it comes to money and politics. What's not to like uh, about that combo? Uh, Michael Smith is joining us now. Senior reporter on Bloomberg's national team is joining us on Ken Griffin spending boatloads of money to put his stamp on Trump's GOP. Michael, walk me through what you learned. Well, what we learned is that uh, Ken Griffin is one of the most influential donors to the Republican Party in America. Um, In the last uh, 10 years or so, he's donated almost $250 million to Republican causes and candidates. Um, And this year alone, he's spending tens of millions of dollars to back the Republican primary candidates that he really likes that sort of share his conservative pro-business views. Uh, and sometimes that sort of clashes with the Republican Party that Trump has um, has shaped, which is much more populist uh, in orientation. Just to remind everybody who Ken Griffin is, where he gets his money from. Yeah, so Ken Griffin is uh, he's uh, he's he's worth about forty two billion dollars as of late. He's the founder and owner of Citadel, which is a one of the largest hedge fund and uh, securities trading firms on Wall Street in the world, actually. And he's incredibly influential or in terms of philanthropy. He gives a lot of money to a lot of different causes. 
and in terms of politics. He's quite outspoken, uh, Republican, pro-Republican um, uh, backer, so to speak. And he, uh, he, he, he regularly uh, zooms in on political issues that he cares about, and he backs it up with his money. Um, is this just a Trump thing, or is this a Republican ticket thing for Ken Griffin? Well, um, it's really, he, he says his goal is to get people elected who will govern well, who will get things done along, you know, in the areas that he's, that he's really interested in, like defense, um, promoting the American dream, he likes to say, which is a whole sort of coterie of, of economic uh, policies that he believes in, and not obstructing uh, good legislation. Like he's he's given to candidates who have challenged a lot of the um, you know Freedom Caucus members in the House, who have been sort of disruptive over the last few years. He doesn't seem to want that kind of legislature in the Congress, so he's directed his money at candidates along those lines. A lot of times, it 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 jives with what Trump wants. He's he's backed a lot of Trump endorsed candidates, but not all the time. Um, so he really seems to be forging um, and says he's forging his own way. What does he say about Donald Trump or does the money do the talking for him? <laughs> well, uh, according to the most recent disclosures that we've been able to find, which are as of uh, this month, actually, um, he hasn't given any money to directly to Trump. Um, and historically, he's no, he hasn't given money to Trump. And he's, um, you know, but he had, you know, it's not, he hasn't come out uh, directly against Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, he says he's still deciding, I think, and still sort of uh, to be, to be, to be announced at whatever step he takes by election day. Um, so, but he's been quite careful not to um, directly finance Trump's campaign, at least so far from what we can see. Now, it's easy to talk about, you know, Ken Griffin supporting uh, the GOP, but, you know, there's some billionaires also uh, on the Democratic side that also put a lot of money into these super PACs and stuff, right? That's correct. Uh, this is not a Republican thing. Uh, and ever since, uh, you know, the Supreme Court made some rulings in the mid-2000s that basically allowed uh, individuals or to to give as much money as they want to so-called super PACs. These are political action committees that uh, back a cause or find ways to support candidates. Um, you know, you've, you've got money pouring in from all sides. Uh, so this is quite common. And Ken Griffin just happens to be one of the biggest ones on the Republican side. So what's his track record of the, the candidates who've received his money? Has he been successful in getting them elected? Well, our reporting shows that he's supported about 60 candidates, either wow. via these massive infusions of money to super PACs that in turn support them, or directly as an individual supporting uh, a candidate's campaign. Under federal law, you can give up to $6,600 per cycle to a candidate directly, but you can give unlimited amounts uh, in support of a candidate through a PAC that targets that campaign. So anyway, he's, he's supported... Um, about 60 candidates, and uh, roughly two-thirds of those uh, have won their elect election. Uh, the others, we'll see what happens. Is he, like a, is he a single-issue kind of donor? Like, is there one thing that he really stands for that, that, that he's pushing for all the candidates that he's supporting kind of thing? Yeah, he says uh, he, well, no, it's not single issue, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a, a package of things. I mean, he, he cites a number of different things in, you know, in, in his comments to us, for example, and just sort of through the reporting that we were able to do, um, you know, securing the borders, halting and reversing inflation, uh, protecting young people from war, uh, from going to war, and also uh, encouraging the American dream. So those are pretty sweeping concepts. Yeah, I was like, that's not that, very specific, but sure. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, so, uh, but that's that's how he describes what he's looking for, and in effect, that's kind of the the kind of candidates you're seeing: uh, traditional conservative Republicans um, that he believes fit that mold that that I just described. And money left over to buy a stegosaurus. 
And we did, didn't you buy something in the south of France? Wasn't it a boatload of millions or something? Probably. <laughs> yes, well, he, he just bought a, a modest home in Saint-Tropez. I think it's uh, worth more than $90 million. Um, and he, yes, he just bought in auction a uh, complete Stegosaurus uh, skeleton mm -hmm. for $45 million. We just don't know if the Stegosaurus so, is going in his Saint-Tropez No, I think he's, he's actually uh, donating that to a museum or at yes, least. Yes, he, uh, yeah. The, yeah. The hey, hey, Michael. He is going to, exactly, he's going to donate to a museum. Michael, you got to leave it there. We really appreciate it. Michael Smith uh, joining us from the Bloomberg National team. I should point out, it's not a big take, my bad, but it is a Bloomberg Little B, which means it's an exclusive uh, to Bloomberg news definitely check it out uh by michael smith and bill allison about ken griffin and his contributions to the gop and really shaping that party you're listening to the bloomberg intelligence podcast catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m eastern on apple carplay and android auto with the bloomberg business app listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on youtube Alex Steele here alongside John Tucker. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business, economics, and finance through our lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. So our next guest is going to give us a great perspective, sort of inside the mind of hedge funds and institutional investors and other clients. Uh, joining us now is Sarah Samuels, Head of Investment Manager Strategy at NEPC. NEPC is one of the industry's largest independent full-service investment consulting firms. They serve more than 400 clients with over $1.6 trillion in assets under advisement. Sarah joins us now. Sarah, great to have you joining us from Boston. Thanks for joining us. Alex, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me on the show. You bet. I also should point out, John Tucker, that Sarah wrote a children's book about financial literacy for kids. Really? Yes. Which, you know what? You and I yes. could probably use also. I could probably yeah. use that. I definitely could have used that Are we still, uh, still telling kids to save? Actually, to, to go a step further than saving. It's telling them to be brave, take some risks, and try their hand at investing. I think at, at the, given the current rate environment, you probably have to go out a little. Yeah, That's yeah. Um, we'll get to that, too, because my daughter very much enjoyed that book. Um, but, Sarah, for the, for the pros, for the profesh in the market, um, what are people mm -hmm. thinking and doing right now? So the big theme that we're seeing among our clients at NEPC, and we work with endowments and foundations, we work with family offices, we work with public and corporate pension funds, we work with lots of different clients, and we help manage their entire portfolios across private markets, private equity, hedge funds, and anything publicly traded. So the big theme that we're seeing in our clients' portfolios today is that investors are getting less money back from their private market investments than they had expected and budgeted. And for distributions and deal activity to pick up, we really need to see valuations reset further or for the cost of capital to come down, which we're beginning to see recently. And, you know, what we're really telling our clients is that this could be a great time to put capital to work. Okay, so uh, let's focus on the liquidity picture right now. What is it? Yes. Uh, what are the implications? Okay, so when we think about why does liquidity matter, especially from private markets investments, um, because look, capital and liquidity for institutional investors is really necessary to fund their operations and to help these institutions achieve their missions. What are their missions? You know, this is something where an endowment will send college kids to school, a hospital system helps take care of the sick. A public fund or a retirement system helps retirees live comfortably. And these big money institutions like public funds, endowments, foundations, family offices, they might have 20 up to 40 or maybe even 50 percent of their portfolios in private equity and venture capital and private debt and real assets. And so this drop in liquidity that we've seen, this drop in distributions relative to what they've modeled is really impacting their ability to support their missions. Mm. And so why are these exits lower? Why is there less liquidity today? Um, it really has to do with a few things. One is the cost of financing. So it used to be four to five percent for to take on debt in a lower rate environment for a buyout, for example. And buyout debt is typically floating rate. So now it's eight, nine or 10 percent. And that really in, eats into the profitability of these underlying portfolio companies and buyers and sellers cannot meet on price. So that's a lot, though. I wasn't really aware that some of these foundations and family offices have as much as 40 percent or more, like 20. OK, maybe less. Mm -hmm. But 40 percent. Does that number change now that they're having a hard time getting those getting their money back in essence does it change well, how so they allocate 
You might think that they would be backing off. These are really smart investors, though, and they're very extremely long term oriented. So one one study by Collar Capital found that over 80 percent of investors plan to increase or hold steady their private markets exposure in the next several years. And that, so investors are showing that they really still believe in private markets. Um, they are getting frustrated with a lack of distributions. Does everybody agree on the valuations? No, no, we do not agree on the valuations. And so we are seeing the M&A market begin to warm up again, as I'm sure you've been talking about on the show. And that's a function of a couple of, of things, but it's really starting to loosen up this uh, transaction um, capability in the marketplace. And what's happening is that banks are beginning to re-enter the market, which is providing more capital at potentially a lower rate. And there's been a, a bevy of, of dollars raised for private debt funds. And private debt has been lending to these portfolio companies at nine or ten percent. Now there's competition for capital, so in a way, there's been a sneaky rate cut, which has found its way into the cost of debt financing. Hmm. So that instead of costing nine percent or ten percent to take on debt for these types of strategies, it's more like eight or nine percent. And the cost of financing really has a lot to do with where we're able to um, exit a company and what we do to agree upon price. So there are a lot of um, buyers and sellers who are not able to meet in the middle. I believe we're going to get there, but the sellers may need to come down a little bit. All right. This feels like a good moment, though, to pivot to your book. So I mentioned that you wrote a children's book for Literacy for Kids, Braving Our Savings. Can you tell us like what it's about and how you deal with, with savings when it comes to your kids? Because, man, when she put me to shame when uh, when she was telling me about this earlier. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Alex, for, for um, bringing it up. So the book is called Braving Our Savings. And it's a children's book. It's available on Amazon. It's available. I'm giving it away to lots of kids. If you know of any organizations that are serving underrepresented kids, uh, please let me know. But the goal of Braving Our Savings is to empower kids from all economic backgrounds to invest and be brave. And we've had great support from really a trifecta. From uh, We've had endorsements from the investment community. So folks at NASDAQ, for example, and NEPC. We've had lots of partnerships, over 20 with nonprofits. And then the pro sports community has really stepped up in endorsing the book, like Alex Rodriguez, Kyle Arrington, Brandon Copeland, Jonathan Jones. These are Patriots players, and we all know Alex Rodriguez. And this has really helped to amplify the message and broaden our reach. So we've given over 2,500 books away to kids at this point, and we're just getting started. Uh, where is financial literacy right now? Just um, oh, how big of a gap is there? Just a it's getting a lot better. So many more states are beginning to have it as an essential. Um, yes, it is promising. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot of shame and fear around money when you get to the individual family le level. And that because it's not taught in schools, it leaves the <sighs> discussion to the dinner table. And many families just aren't equipped to have these conversations. So we want to sort of expand kids' families and become part of them and begin to show them things that maybe their their core tribes aren't able to. But what's so interesting, Sarah, is like you talk about taking risk, like kids investing in stocks like that. I mean, you know, not on like a large scale, but like learning yeah. how to not only manage money, but make money. That's right. And, you know, it's a really important skill to learn. And especially if you come from the, a place of not having much money as a child, you may be less likely to take risks, which just extends that cycle of making ends meet. Because if you don't take risks, then you may not be able to sort of change, have a step function change. And I've taught 1,700 kids live in the last three months. And I can tell you that they get it, even at a very young age. They you're, not, you're not talking you about turning them into there. day traders, though, right? Yeah, that's right. We need okay. to be careful of that. No, no day traders. Like, there's still a risk <laughs> element that we want to protect. But um, it's super We're awesome. Investors. Uh, yeah, thank Sa you. Sarah, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you for the perspective, uh, head of investment manager research over at NEPC. But also, thank you for the book, Sarah. Braving our savings. I'll be buying one for John Tucker. <laughs> just after the break. Uh, Sarah Samuels joining us from Boston, Massachusetts. But it's such an interesting point. I mean, I remember uh, I didn't know anything about budgeting or savings or how to manage anything until I bought like a book in my late 20s when I was in debt. It was like how to get out of debt. And that's when I started to learn stuff. Hey, I would argue a lot of uh, uh, small business owners don't know it either, especially those like doctors and dentists. 
They don't teach you business in no. those schools. Which you, which you really should. And I like the idea that you're actually sort of investing to grow, not just putting money in a Citibank savings account. No offense to Citibank, but actually like trying to think about wealth in a different way. I thought that was really cool. Great. Great. You know, you got to save up to buy that table saw. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Alex Steele alongside John Tucker. Paul Sweeney's off today. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business and finance and economics through your lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence folks. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries around the world. And one of them is Anurag Rana, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst. And he's joining us to look ahead to Microsoft earnings, but also like what is happening right now. Microsoft is down almost 2%. Uh, NVIDIA is off by over 6%. Tech is starting to get hit very hard. Anurag, what's going on? So I think if you look at it, you know, since the launch of ChatGPT, uh, you know, a year and a half ago or so, almost two years ago, we have seen a massive run up in all technology stocks, except especially the largest and the biggest ones. And what we've saw today and, and what we've been seeing for the last two to three weeks is just a big rotation from the large cap into the small cap. And I think that's really what's driving a lot of this thing. I don't think there is anything more, to, more than that particular element. So what's the key number when uh, Microsoft delivers results after the close? Yeah, see, Azure cloud growth remains the most important factor for uh, Microsoft when they report tonight. This figure grew 31% last quarter, and Street's expecting between 30 and 31% right now. So I think that's the first number we will look for. And the second part would be what kind of guidance they give on the conference call as to what would be this number for next quarter. Frankly speaking, this is the only thing that matters. Um, there's, uh, there is discussions about how much CapEx is going to go up as well, but I think this is still the most important thing we need to focus on. What's the, what's the contribution to uh, Azure? Am I saying that right? Azure? From, yeah. From yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so what we have calculated now, remember for Microsoft's case, they do not publicly disclose the dollar number of Azure growth, um, the Azure uh, sales. Um, but they only give the growth rates. What we have done is some kind of backward calculations is, in the last quarter, contribution from all AI was roughly around a billion dollars, or which on an annualized basis is about $4 billion. So um, in terms of the contribution in percentage points, they grew 31% last year, uh, last quarter, and out of that, seven percentage points of growth was because of AI. So that's another metric we're gonna look for is what kind of contribution they get this time and what could we expect next time. Today, the news is that Microsoft is reporting an outage uh, of some office and cloud services. That doesn't feel good into earnings, particularly after the CrowdStrike incident. Why is this stuff happening? See, one of the things is to remember is this thing is so big right now, and they, they, these guys, um, you know, you could say whether it's a software update or cyber attack, I'm not saying in this case it is a cyber attack, but there is so much pressure on a lot of these larger uh, cloud vendors to make sure their services are up, and which should be, because these need to be up 99.99% of the time uh, because so much depends on it. So there is always going to be scrutiny anytime there is any disruption in services, uh, but, I, but I have a feeling that Microsoft will get a lot of questions on the call today about not just this outage, but what happened with CrowdStrike and how could let Microsoft let you know, some, something mm -hmm. like that happen. How much does Microsoft depend on other companies like NVIDIA, for instance? Well, they do depend on it because at the end of the day, if they are getting a lot of AI demand coming in, let's say from, the, from OpenAI, because OpenAI's backend is Microsoft, uh, cloud uh, infrastructure services. If they are not able to get GPUs from NVIDIA, they can't expand at that same rate at which the growth is coming. So there is a bottleneck over there when it comes to chip supply, when it comes to just the expansion of the data center architecture or the infrastructure. Um, those are very important things and uh, you know that could also be a concern for uh, expansion of AI into next year. Do, does at some point they say to themselves, hey, we don't want to be dependent on NVIDIA, let's do it ourselves? Or is that even a threat uh, in other parts of the industry? 
Well, most cloud companies are working on their own chips, their own design that works in their own data centers. But frankly speaking, at this point, NVIDIA is the person or the company that we can give them those GPU chips that are needed to train some of these large language models. Um, down the road, yeah, anything can happen, but that's not, you know, it, uh, you know, unlike just creating a new building, this is not that easy. It takes years to build up a capacity and even come up with anything close to what NVIDIA is doing. Uh, we heard, um, well, CNBC reported that Delta's sort of looking at CrowdStrike to, for some um, compensation based on the outages and how much money they had to put out uh, to manage their clients. It, is Microsoft going to see the same thing from companies or does Microsoft go to CrowdStrike? How does all that interaction work? Yeah, this is where the lawyers are going to get really creative because Microsoft has much, much deeper pockets than anybody else out there. And one of the things we think what's going to happen down the road, this is going to force companies to work with larger vendors because they have deeper pockets. When it comes to business interruption, you know, large companies can go after the likes of, you know, whether it's Microsoft or Amazon or Google, uh, if they are buying more technology products from them. So we think there is going to be a movement, but, but I am dead sure we're going to see so many more claims coming in, not just on CrowdStrike, but Microsoft as well uh, down the road. Now, what happens with that, you know, that's I'm sure is going to be a, a lengthy battle. If I use their office applications and I want to protect myself, do I have to, do I get less cloudy? <laughs> Uh, not really. In fact, the more you are in public cloud, the safer it is just because the dollar amount of money that's going to protect those services. Um, you may be worse off if you just have, you know, your own device without any extra protection on it and you're, you know, don't have that level of third party, uh, you know, firewalls protecting it. All right, Anurag, we're really excited uh, to see this play out over the next few hours and then into earnings. We're looking forward to your analysis uh, on that as well. That's Anurag Rana, uh, Bloomberg Senior Technology Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us on Microsoft, that stock uh, heading lower into the earnings report, where it's going to be about the Azure growth, makeup of AI, and then that CapEx and sort of how all three of them work together. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Alex Steele alongside John Tucker. Paul Sweeney is up today. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We bring you all the top news in business and finance and economics and commodities, because you know me, I love commodities. Uh, looking at the oil market here, it's down by over 1%. You also have aluminum down by over 1%. Overall, uh, this sector has been hit quite hard. I mean, oil is near a seven-week low. It really does feel like the likes we've heard from, say, Heineken, the weaker readings over in GDP in Germany, all of that circles around China and the lack of demand there. There's also, though, some still interesting uh, investment opportunities within the sector here. You're just looking at the S&P uh, Energies Index over the last six months. It's up a healthy 8.6%. And many say, you know what? The commodities may have its moment uh, in the sun right now as we head into the back half of the year. So you wanted to talk to someone with some money in the, in the ground. That's funny. Money in the ground? Yeah, let's go for it. Do we like that? <laughs> okay. Hard assets, real assets? All right. Will it uh, grow Tyler, in the ground? Tyler Rosenlich is head of natural resource equities over at Cohen & Steers. Uh, he joins us now in the studio. Cohen & Steers is the leading global investment manager with about $80.7 uh, billion in assets under management uh, that looks to diversified real assets and energy broadly. Tyler, welcome. Thank you for having me. What do you make of this energy space right now? Yeah, you know, we think um, there's a lot of tension going on in global energy today. You know, clearly there's questions about long-term demand for traditional resources and obviously all the growth that we see in alternatives as we pursue a global energy transition. You know, when you talk about oil prices here and now, you know, one thing that we've been spending a lot of time on is, you know, obviously demand does seem like it's weakening, but we think some of the weakness in crude is, is really more supply related. As we look at global oil supplies into 2025, we actually see a lot of supply coming, not just from OPEC, but from North America and from other non-OPEC producers like Guyana, like Brazil, like Namibia and so forth. So um, oil feels a little bit challenged here, but you know, we always take a step back and say, people hear the word energy and they think oil, and oil's not the only part of global energy markets going forward. I mean, oil's a big driver of uh, production and energy supply, but natural gas is growing a lot, nuclear's growing a lot, alternatives continue to grow, and so we think that there's things that look really good and things that look a little more challenged as we head into next year. 
How much does China control your life as an investor in oil and energy? Um, you know, um, it's funny. Today, it's a lot less about China as you think about energy and way more about AI and the demand that we see for energy broadly. So when you talk about an oil molecule, clearly China is a big driver there. But when you're talking about energy broadly, it's really about all energy supply. And can we provide the electricity and the other um, uh, energy resources that we need to satisfy technological advances, to uh, satisfy a, a rising middle class globally, urbanization, desire to travel, and so forth. So here and now, um, I think everybody thinks China's slowing. Uh, it's really more about, hey, is energy intensity changing in other mm -hmm. ways, and, and how's that going to drive things? And you brought in AI, and that, in essence, is the data centers need a lot of energy in order to run. Um, I'm, I'm con I I keep reading information that, yes, the power demand is going to be huge, but we're maybe overestimating that demand right now. How do you view it as an investor? Yeah, so um, we think about sort of long-term cycles as much as we can, and we spend a lot of time thinking about what the future of energy is going to be. And we start with where demand is going to go in the next few decades. So we built a model that says, what is energy gonna, demand going to be in 2040? And there's really three factors that you would care about. The first is population growth. Basically, more people in 2040 means more energy consumption. The second would be economic growth. Bigger economy, more energy consumption. The third one is a trickier one, which is the energy intensity of the global economy. Basically, how efficient can we be consuming energy to generate economic growth? You know, we've been of the view that we are going to get a lot more energy efficient. Technology is changing. Costs are coming down. There's desire from governments and consumers to be um, better users of energy. I'm a little bit worried about that assumption, to be honest. It mm -hmm. does feel like the economic growth is becoming more energy intense as a lot of this technolo technological growth is going to be um, really high energy usage. So you know, we've thought that the demand for energy was, was going to rise a lot. And candidly, we think we might have underestimated it. Now, there's huge expectations for AI in the short term and what that might mean for energy demand. Are those overstated potentially? But in the very long term, we think we are in an energy addition world. We really need to add as much supply as we can. Well, we're talking about oil. We're not just talking about energy. We're talking about all the other stuff that oil makes. I brushed my mm. teeth this morning. Mm -hmm. Oil was in my toothpaste, mm -hmm. and it was used to make my toothbrush. Mm -hmm. And that's just the start of it. I mean. We, are you are you smart enough to tell me what the breakdown in a barrel of crude is? How much of that is used for energy, and how much is that used to mm. produce all the stuff? that One hundred percent, no. Okay. <laughs> how about you? I mean, a, a lot of oil demand um, comes from transportation fuels. Um, it's flying, it's driving, it's all that sort of stuff. Clearly, there's a lot of it that goes into every other product that we use. Um, but when you talk about oil, it's not always just the oil barrel, right? You get a lot of those petrochemicals from what we call natural gas liquids, uh, NGLs. Um, when we think about energy, again, a, a lot of times the conversation becomes around oil prices. But as we think into the future, we think oil demand is going to keep growing a little bit, and then it sort of plateaus later this decade and declines a little bit in the 2030s. But huge increase in demand for natural gas uh, for all the reasons that you laid out in terms of how it's ubiquitous in our daily lives, but then also as you know, global consumers consume way more of all this stuff. Well, so what, what do you like right now? Like, what do you want to invest in? Yeah, so um, we look at the world as, hey, it's not just, like I said, oil and gas. It's mm -hmm. all of the energy value chain, which includes both traditional resources and alternative resources. And I'd say we see massive winners across both sides of the table. On the traditional side, um, we really like U.S. natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, we think LNG demand as we export to global consumers is going to rise a lot in the next few years. We also think the supply is going to be a little more curtailed into 2025 and 2026. So we like natural gas. Um, we really like the Canadian oil sands, where we think it's very low variable cost. They've built their businesses to survive $60 oil, um, and we think they're generating a lot of free cash that they're delivering to investors. And we also like um, sort of integrated energy companies that are pursuing the energy transition themselves credibly, using their existing infrastructure and assets to help sort of drive emissions changes. I'd say on the alternative side, we are very bullish, the companies that are building out the electrification assets and infrastructure we need to satisfy the sort of uh, growing electricity demand, companies that build transmission wires and transmission lines and so forth. And we're also really bullish nuclear in the long run. You know, we do think it's going to be about refurbishing existing nuclear assets and building new nuclear globally uh, to satisfy the demand for low carbon energy. Yeah, you know, Bill Gates just broke ground on his uh, nuclear power mm -hmm. plant. 
up at where? Montana, I think. I don't remember. You remember? I, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, sounds it's right. a, a sodium-based uh, nuclear power plant, which you know, sodium can capture a much more of the heat energy that is generated, and you can use it as a storage facility as well. So use that energy whenever you need it. Wait, let me ask you this question. How much petrochemicals are in your toothpaste? Because I think you might actually know this. Uh, I believe uh, 5.87%. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I was going to totally You're like believe looking it. at my screen. Where's he getting um, that from? So, uh, no, but it is yeah. in your toothpaste. I know. It's in everything it's in you everything use. It's in everything you use. Uh, Tyler, when you talk about integrated companies that are really taking the energy transition seriously, well, what's your judgment case on that? Yeah, you know, um, we think a lot of energy companies are generating a lot of cash today, and the opportunity cost of that cash is fairly high. Investors are sort of requiring it to be paid out in dividends or via stock or purchases. But I think what people forget is energy companies own hard assets. They might own pipelines in the ground that you can convert to move hydrogen. Or maybe they're experts in developing large-scale infrastructure projects, which part of it is energy, but part of it is can you deal with permitting? Can you deal with government re regulations? Can you finance large, large wind projects and so forth? So for us, it's about, hey, what is your competitive advantage? Can you utilize your existing labor force or your existing asset base to actually pursue alternative investments at accretive returns? And we think there are some companies that definitely can. There's some that won't. There's some that will do very silly, silly M&A. They'll destroy a lot of capital over time. But those that get it right, we think, will be you know, great leaders in the next decade. All right, Tyler, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Super interesting. Uh, Tyler Rosenlicht, a head of natural resource equities over at Conan Steers. We didn't get to this point, but also how much of that's going to be dependent on policy from governments, too, to know that which sort of bets you're going to make on the energy addition or transition is going to work. I'm not even sure we work. have an energy policy or what it is in this country. Well, for the IRA, we have a, uh, an everything kind of thing. Like, let's throw money in a lot of different things and sort of see what sticks, which makes some very nervous because if you put things in the wrong uh, area, then you're going to be wasting time. Um, anyway, much more on that <laughs> coming up. All right, Tyler, thanks a lot. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's get back to JetBlue. The stock's still holding strong here, up by almost 20%. It's deepening its cost cuts in this turnaround plan that it's going through, right? If you can't beat them, join them. And if you join them, you're cutting costs. Uh, we're going to George Ferguson now, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Aerospace Defense and Airlines Analyst on this. Are you surprised by the extent of the stock move here based on the news? I, I am a bit. So it makes you wonder, too, if there wasn't some a, a fair amount of short activity in here that's probably trying to get out of the way when things mm. move this quickly. Uh, but still, I think that, that you know, what JetBlue is presenting today is definitely the right way forward, right? I mean, it's all about lowering capacity, firming up fares, uh, and they have they already have a uh, the Mint product that's a premium product that ought to help them bring in some better uh, revenues. So uh, I think it's the right way forward. I just think the move is probably a little bit dramatic. And they've cleared a day on your calendar, George, because they've canceled Investor Day. That can't be a good sign. Uh, well... Yeah, I think when companies have less exciting things to talk about, they can invest today. We saw United can it early, earlier, uh, you know, before this earnings period. It made me think there's something going on. So, uh, yeah, agreed. But, again, uh, my guess is we're, we have a lot of the bad news out for the airline industry now. It's, it's a function of getting people to cut capacity, which are going to improve fares. And so they may just... Short of that, they may not have much else to talk about. So they increased to 15 the number of cities where they're ending service, uh, and they've uh, oh, what already cut more than 50 routes. So um, you know the growth prospects for this airline aren't aren't that great. Well, so and you watch them uh, again defer airplanes, which I largely think are all about growth. There's some replacement at that. Uh, but you wouldn't defer airplanes you needed for replacement. So essentially, I think their fleet plan told us, too, that they're uh, not a lot of growth. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're back to that old question about what is JetBlue going to be when it grows up, right? Uh, but I, I think near term, you got to make sure you keep the balance sheet in good shape and, and get the uh, income statement healthy, and then you can start to think about 
What are your long-term options? What do you want to be? So you have the top line, and then you have the cost-cutting measures and the streamlining, which is going to wind up helping um, to support, as you mentioned, the balance sheet. When do you think that they tackle that top line question then? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. The, the what line question? The, the top, top line, line like actually growing here and, and becoming the company it's going to be. Uh, well, look, I mean, I think this summer, uh, again, we just see too much capacity. And so there's, there's, it's going to be really hard to grow that top line. I mean, uh, and then, you know, with the cuts they're bringing, m my sense is they don't see this market being ripe to be growing strongly and at least strongly, right? They're still, they're still taking aircraft. And so they're still, they're still growing to a certain degree, but they're not looking to grow like they were in the past. And it tells me, you know, they, they think this could persist even into, I guess next year and the years following, uh, I think that's a pretty long way to look out. So, uh, uh, you know, not, I'm not sure all the drivers behind cutting things in 2026, 2027. Uh, but, you know, when do they figure out what they want to be in the long run and how to grow that top line in a large way? Mm, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't, I don't have an answer to that one. Is, is Southwest something of a template for JetBlue? Uh, well, I, you know, I'd argue that JetBlue is already further down the road on premium and on, on revenue generation than probably Southwest. Southwest, to me, seems like an airline that needs to become more like a full-service carrier. Their costs are just as high. They, they run the entire length of the country, right? And do a bunch of the you know the near-term international markets um, so to me I think Southwest started looking more towards the full service and has got to sort of keep going there given their footprint I, I JetBlue is too small like JetBlue it just isn't uh, you know they're, they're a niche carrier they're not uh, they're not a full service carrier yeah. um, they you know East Coast New York uh, expensive cities in the East Coast they, they've got they've got this niche and it's great stuff but yeah, again, the question is, where do you go from there? All right, George, great stuff. Appreciate Europe. it. They definitely don't want to be compared to Southwest. They Long Island City not based that. Jet Blue, There you go. I should point All right, George, I'll be talking to you later because Airbus is also reporting earnings in just about two hours' time. George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence, a senior aerospace defense and airlines analyst, joining us there. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, Tune in and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.